I was in turmoil this week. I'd been studying to, to teach on the book of Hosea, and then uh, late in the week, felt led in a different direction, and so prepared in that direction, and then early this morning, was led back to the book of Hosea again. So uh, I can only trust that God is leading, and so I'm going to hold fast to what we, what we originally tried to do, and, and just pray that God will bring forth His Word uh, so that it touches our hearts and, and helps us to see His His love, His grace, and His mercy, and His judgment. So if you're with me this morning, I'd like for you to turn to Hosea. It's in the Old Testament. It's not that big a book. It's 14 chapters. We're not going to look at all 14 chapters, but we are going to look at uh, some of them. And uh, as we go before the Lord, excuse me, as we go before the Lord and, and seek His help in this, this book of Hosea has, has a lot to teach us because it's talking about a time period in the history of Israel and, and uh, Judah, and often in the book, this book, Israel is called Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim being one of the sons of, of Joseph. So in this book, Israel and Ephraim are synonymous, as, as we read. And Judah is, is separate, the southern kingdom. And God is speaking and giving an example through a man who was a priest named Hosea. And it starts out in the very beginning of the book of Hosea. It says, The Lord spoke His word to Hosea, son of Beeri, when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah, and when Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king of Israel. So it gives us a time frame as to when uh, this was taking place. And remember, as we study God's word, we, talk, we say, who is speaking? Who is he speaking to? What were the circumstances of that that were around going on at that time? What is being said and how does it affect us? So those five points we always look at. So we know here that the Lord is speaking. He's speaking to through Hosea to Israel and Judah. And the time period here is a time when Israel and Judah had turned from God and were going back and worshiping idols. And they were involved in all kinds of of sensual and worldly practices in the worship of those idols. This is a very unusual book because God tells uh, Hosea to do some things that we just see, think are un unreasonable in our natural way, but God is using Hosea and his circumstances to teach a lesson to the Israelites. So let's look at it, starting in Hosea verse, or chapter 1 and verse 2, and he says this, he says, The Lord spoke first to Hosea and told him, Go marry a prostitute and have children by that prostitute. Now that doesn't sound like something God would normally say to us, does it? But remember, this was a cir circumstance that was special. And, and when we're reading God's Word, as we're reading this, who's, who's speaking and who are they speaking to and what were the circumstances, we'll find that there are some places in the Bible where things were being said in a special way that don't apply to us universally. So this is one of those times. He says, go marry yourself a prostitute and have children by her. The people of this land, he says, people of Israel, have acted like prostitutes and abandoned the Lord. So the circumstances here are the people had abandoned God. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim. And she became pregnant and bore a son. And the Lord called, told Hosea, name him Jezreel. Because in a little while, I'm going to punish Jehu's family for the people they slaughtered at Jezreel. Then I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. So we're starting to see some, some pretty hefty things here. And while we're studying this, the last two things that on our, our five points is what's being said and how does it apply to us. And as we read through this and we study it, I'd like for us to recognize that the things that God is speaking to Israel about are also things that apply to here in America and apply maybe to some of us individually. 
And so we can take what's being said and we can apply it to ourselves and to our nation because God is speaking about his heart and how he feels about people who honor him and people who dishonor him. So he says here, I'm going to put an end to the kingdom of Israel. On that day, I'm going to break Israel's bows and arrows in the valley of Jezreel. Now, here Hosea married this woman, Gomer. She was a prostitute. She was an unfaithful wife. And it says that she had this child, and God told him to name him Jezreel, because in the valley of Jezreel, there was going to be a retribution for things that had gone wrong. Then he goes on in verse 6, Gomer became pregnant again, and she had a daughter this time. And the Lord told Hosea, name her Lo-Ruhamah, which means unloved. Why would it name a child unloved? Once again, it's because God is trying to teach through them a lesson to Israel. And he's saying, if you keep being unfaithful, I'm, you're going to find yourself unloved. Now, we know that God's love is without bounds. But what He does in His love, what, the way He treats us in His love, He's telling Israel, I'm going to take you and I'm going to treat you as though I don't love you if you keep this up. So, He says, and I, he says I'm no longer going to love the nation of Israel. I'm no longer going to forgive them. That's a harsh statement, and, and we don't want to hear that in our own lives. We don't want to hear it about our own country. And as we read on, we're going to find out why. He says, Yet I will love the descendants of Judah, and I will rescue them, because I am the Lord their God. I won't use bows and swords, war, wars and horses and horsemen to rescue them. After, Gomer, after that, Gomer, again, became pregnant, and she had another son. And now we're down in, in verse 9 of the first chapter. And the Lord said, Name your son Lo-Ami, or not my people. So God is saying now, he said, using, using uh, Gomer as the example of an, of an unfaithful nation, because she's an unfaithful wife, he's saying, I am not going to express my love to Israel anymore because of the unfaithfulness. And now he says, I'm not even going to call you my people anymore. In other words, he's saying, Hosea, don't even call her your wife. Don't even call her your wife anymore, Hosea, because I'm not going to call the nation of Israel my people anymore. He says, you are no longer my people and I'm no longer your God. What a terrible place to be. What a terrible place to find yourself where God says, I am not going to call you my people and I'm not going to be your God anymore. You say, our God doesn't act like that. Well, certainly He does. He just said He was. There is a time when God says, I am not going to... I am not going to keep pouring out my blessings upon you because you are unfaithful to me. He says, yet the Israelites will become as numerous as the, as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the, on the seashore. They're going to become numerous. And they were going to be, they're going to be told, you're the children of the living God. Even though God's, path, God's uh, judgment is coming against them, they're going to have... That, that reputation of being the children of God. So he goes on in chapter 2 and he says, now, to, to speaking to the children, call, call your brothers, Ami, or my people, and call your sisters, Ruamah, or loved. Plead with your mother and plead with her and say, she looks to tell her she should no longer act like uh, she no longer acts like a wife, so she should no longer and no longer treats me like her husband. Tell her to stop acting like a prostitute. Tell her to remove the lovers from between her breasts. If she refuses, I'm going to strip her naked. I'm going to show show her for what she is, and then I won't love her children because they're children of, of prostitution. Listen, folks, we here in America have been replacing God with all kinds of philosophies. We've been replacing God with all kinds of things. We think that we are something because we, have, we are wealthy. We think that we are something because we are powerful in the eyes of the world. We think that we are something because we, we have all these blessings around us, but we forget who gave us the blessings and who lifted us up and gave us the wealth. We forget who has empowered us. And that's what was happening with Israel. They were forgetting about God. 
And in chapter 3, it says, the Lord told me, or let's stop there for a second. We have forgotten that God is the one who gave to us everything we have. That before God brought us here, and before we lived in this place, and before God instructed us while we were here, before God had increased our armies and increased our wealth, we were nothing but a barren land here. America, America was nothing. The world didn't even know anything about America. And then God brought our forefathers, the pilgrims and the, uh, here and the Puritans here. And no matter what anyone says, these people did not come here to promote slavery. And they did not come here to overpower the Indians. They came here because God was sending them here to find a place where they could worship Him without the, uh, the, uh, in, the intrusion of, of, of false leaders, of governments, of false churches that was trying to bear down on them and hold them down and not allow them to have the freedom to just worship God. Yes, there were things that went wrong in our land. Yes, the Indians were mistreated. Yes, the way they, were, they were slaves that were brought here. But those were not the, thing, the reasons why the men and women who came here at the, at the beginning came here. They came here for the freedom to worship the Lord and to preach the gospel and to spread the gospel throughout this world. That's what they came here for. God brought them here. Just like God brought Israel out of Egypt, He brought Americans, or He brought the church, out of Europe and brought them to this place. And He gave to us this land flowing with milk and honey. It was a great land. It is a great land. And yes, there are things that were done wrong here. Things that cannot be undone. And so let's try to, let's just quit trying to undo the wrongs that were done. Let's recognize that they were wrong and then move on. This, this land we call America is a great blessing. It's a blessing to me. It's a blessing to you. You're here. You're, you, are, uh, you are being uh, blessed by it. You are, you are living in the privileges of being here in America. Let's just praise God for that. We're... We're right now in the middle of, a, or starting a week of Thanksgiving. And I think the best thing we can do is just start thanking God for the things that we have. Thank God that, that He has brought us to this place. See, Israel had been brought out of Egypt and been given the promised land. And while they were there, they built up their empire. God helped them. He gave them judges and He gave to them kings and they became mighty. They overpowered their enemies along the way. People who, by the way, lived in those lands prior to Israel getting there. Just like the American Indians lived in this land prior, prior to the Europeans getting here. And God moved those people aside so that Israel could occupy that territory. And God, is, God has helped the, the Europeans who came here to take over this land. And maybe it wasn't done exactly the way God wanted us to do it. But we have to remember that God was still in the process of building a great nation. And then, as we became strong, we turned away from God. And so God brought us into a, great, a time of a great civil war. Where we fought amongst ourselves, just like the northern and the southern kingdoms of, of Israel fought against themselves. Brother against brother. And in that time, he, he showed us that we could trust in Him and not in, not in our own strength. And then He moved us on to World War I and World War II. And in those times, God blessed us and strengthened us. But He caused depression to come upon this land so that the people in this country would cry out to Him. And recognize that it wasn't our armies who were saving us. It wasn't our air force. It wasn't our navy. It was God. So God says to Hosea, He says, I want you to do something. I want you to go and love your wife again. Just like God is saying to, said to Israel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you to myself. I'm going to love you again. Even though she has loved others. Even though we have turned and we, we, we've trusted in our allies and we've trusted in our wealth and we've trusted in our industry and we've trusted in our, our intelligence. He says, they, they, they committed adultery by 
loving other people by, by going to other, other ways. He says, love her as I, the Lord, love the Israelites, even though they have turned to other gods and have loved to eat raisin cakes. So I brought, he says, Hosea says, I bought her back again, and I told her, you must live with me for a long time. The same way that the Israelites are going to stay with the Lord for a long time without having sacrifices. And the Israelites will turn and look to God and David, their king, once again. And they will come trembling to the Lord for His blessing in the last days. Listen, my prayer that I have for America isn't that God will make America strong, not that God will make America prosperous, not that God will make us, make us filled with freedoms and, and all the liberties that we've had, not that God is going to magnify those things. My prayer for America is that God will bring us to our knees. That God will bring us to that place where we cry out to Him in sincerity. Where we recognize that He is God and we are not. Where we recognize that He is in charge and we have to live under His laws. We have to live under His supervision and His guidance and obey, obey His word. For chapter 4 in Hosea says, Listen to the Lord, you Israelites. The Lord has brought these charges against you who live in the land. There is no faith, no love, and no knowledge of God in the land. What do we think about America? I thank God for every one of you who loves the Lord and, and reads your Bible and, and worships God and, and trusts in Him. But even in the church, I'm seeing people turn away from the Word of God. Even in the church, I'm seeing people who put more stock in the government than they do in the Word of God. I see in the church people who, who think that we're going to be great because we're going to try harder. And not because we've fallen down before God and worship Him and make Him God once again. We've made idols out of, out of celebrities. We've made idols out of sports heroes. We've made idols out of politicians. Out of people with lots of money. If a man has millions of dollars, billions of dollars, then automatically we look to him for advice rather than looking to God. If a leader has a great congregation in a church, automatically we think that he is the one who is speaking the truth rather than the one who is putting a challenge before his people and speaking the truth of God's Word and telling them they can't live the way they're living. We've opened the doors of the church to all kinds of sins. and In the book of Hosea, most of the sins that God speaks about to Hosea, he says, are sins of, of adultery, sins of, of, of prostitution. He says, it's because, because of these things that I'm angry. You just look at America. Just look at America. We can't sell a car without, first of all, putting some female in front of the car that's going to attract attention. We can't sell anything in this world. You know, there's a saying that sex sells. And the truth is, it does. But the, the bad part of that is that we are the ones who are paying attention to that and making it so. We, the church has turned away from families and marriage and has opened its door to homosexuality and those things that God says is an abomination in His sight. We no longer look down on, on divorce People who live together without marriage. Church leaders, both in Protestant churches and Catholic churches, have become guilty. We speak lies and call it the Lord's the word of the Lord. We no longer stick to the scriptures, no longer skip, stick to the word of God. We say things that make people feel good. We, we say the things that people want to hear. Because we, if we say the things they want to hear, then they're going to come back and they're going to listen to us again. And if we get them to listen to us enough, maybe they'll give us some of their money. That's why we never, we never ask for your money here. I don't even ask for money from the congregation here. Because... What I'm interested, what we're interested in doing here is preaching the Word of God and setting before you truth. 
and given to you a reason to evaluate your own hearts and your own lives and, and the things around you. What are you putting your faith in? Are you putting your faith in the, in the leadership of our nation? I've got news for you. It doesn't make any difference who's sitting in the White House. They're going to mess up. It doesn't make any difference who's sitting in the Congress and the Senate and the Supreme Court. They're going to make wrong decisions. Because they're human beings. And God says that the heart of man is wicked and deceitful. That our, that our thoughts are wicked and deceitful. So what do we put our faith in? We have to come back to the Lord and put our faith in Him and in His Word and in His promises. He says, there is no faith, no love, and no knowledge of God in this land. There is cursing and lying and murdering and stealing and adultery. People break my laws and there is one murderer after another. That's why this land is drying up and everyone who lives in it is passing away. He says, no one should accuse other people or bring charges against them. My case is against the ministers, the priests, the people who are allowing this to happen without standing up and, and saying something about it. How can we say it's all going to be well? How can we say it's all going to work out good if we're not telling people they have to be obedient to the Word of God? He says I, in verse 6 of chapter 4, he says, I am going to destroy my people because of their ignorance. You've refused to learn. So I'm going to refuse to let you be my, my priests or my leaders. You have forgotten the teachings of your God, so I will forget your children. I'm not going to bless them. See, God has promised. We always like to see the good promises. I'll be with you forever. I, my thoughts for you are good and not for evil. We love those promises. And they're right. They're good. But the condition there is that we are the people that he's talking to. He's not talking to the world about that. He's not talking to the unfaithful. And when we become unfaithful and we become worldly, he speaks these things and he says, I'm going to destroy you. Why in the world, when you look at things... And the overall picture, why in the world should God preserve America? There's only a couple things, I believe, that are standing in the way of destruction. The fact that we are standing by Israel and we're supporting Israel as a nation. The fact that there is a remnant of, of believers in this land who are praying, they're on their knees praying and seeking God. The fact that we are trying to get the Word of God out and tell people who have been abusing the name of the Lord and have been ignoring the Word of God, telling them that there is a better way, that God's love for them is better than the love that they have for the things of this world. John tells us not to love the world nor the things of the world. And he's not talking about the earth and, and the, the trees and, and all that. He's talking about the, the societies that are in the world. He's talking about the world systems. Not to love them or the things that are in them. We're told that there's a way which seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death and destruction. Just because it seems like the right thing doesn't make it the right thing. Some of us are totally against putting prisoners or putting, putting criminals in, in prison. We're totally against taking the Word of God and, and doing exactly what the Word of God says to those who break His laws and yet are in favor of murdering babies who have never done anything wrong, who have never had a chance to ever do anything wrong. We as a nation are guilty. See, we need to evaluate ourselves and our own way of thinking, our own ideas. We're told to bring every thought under subjection to Christ. 
every thought under subjection to Christ. What's that mean? That means we go back to what the Bible says. We go back to what God has been teaching us in His Word. And we seek Him again. Hallelujah. Going back to Hosea. We're in chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 11, he says this. Prostitutes, old wine and new wine have robbed them of their senses. My, seek, my people ask of their wooden idols for help. We don't have so many wooden idols, but we have flesh and blood idols. And we ask them for help. We want their viewpoints. You ever notice how if we have a celebrity who's been living for the devil for many years and, and one day they come to know Jesus Christ because someone witnessed to them of God's love and His grace and His mercy, the Holy Spirit has convicted them, convicted them of sin and righteousness and judgment. And they come and they receive Christ as their Savior. And all of a sudden, because they were a celebrity, we want to make them a voice. They have no knowledge of God's Word except for the fact that God promised to forgive their sins. But yet we want to stand them up before the world and hear what they have to say. Worse yet, when it comes to running a nation, we have politics all around us and we'll go to somebody who has no understanding of the will of God. Somebody who is still living their lives for the devil. Living in adulteries. Selling themselves on, on the movie screens, drinking themselves after death, using the drugs, and we stand them up and ask them, what do they think about how we should run this nation? How foolish can we be? How stupid do we, do we look to God? God said to Israel, I'm going to destroy you because you're looking at these, these other things for, for answers. You're making gods out of these other things and you're not looking to me. He says they commit adulteries, giving themselves to their gods. They offer sacrifices on mountaintops and they burn incense on the hill, hills under oaks and poplars and other trees. That's why your daughters, he says, are becoming prostitutes. And your daughters-in-law commit adultery. I want, to, I want to ask you a question. Someone just said to me this morning. Someone said that they were they they see out, out on the streets so many women dressing like prostitutes. I mean, let's just be let's just be honest with ourselves. Would you, guys and women, guys and girls alike, would you want Christ to come when you're out at the at the club? Would you want Christ to come, come when you're going shopping and your skirts are almost too short to cover your underwear or your pants are so tight you can see everything that's inside of them? Would you want Christ to come at that time? Who are we trying to impress in this world? Are we trying to impress God? Paul says to the church in Corinth, he says, he says, you know, I'm coming and I'm telling you the truth. He says, I'm not trying to please you people. If I was trying to please you people, I wouldn't be telling you the truth. But I'm trying to please God, and so I'm telling you the truth here. See, we are called as Christians to promote the gospel of Christ. And we're not doing it. Moms and dads, you're not teaching your daughters and your sons how to dress when they go out on the street. You're not telling them not to go out if they, if they look like a prostitute. You're not telling them to go, not to go out and, and go to the parties where, where they're doing things that they're not supposed to do. And you know they are. You're just hoping they don't get caught. He said, that's why your daughters have become prostitutes and your daughters-in-law has committed adultery. He said, I'm not going to punish them for becoming prostitutes. Because I'm punishing the adults, the men, who go to the prostitutes, who offer the sacrifices to them. Israel, he says, Israel, you act like a prostitute. We're going to jump from chapter 4 over to chapter 7 real quick so that we can make short work of this, of this book. The chapters between 4 and 7 are all about how God is going to destroy. God is going to punish. God is going to 
to, to take th these things in hand. In chapter 7 he says, Whenever I want to heal Israel, all I can see is their sin and their wickedness. The people cheat each other. They break into houses and steal. They rob people in the streets. They don't realize that I remember all of these evil things. I'm seeing them. They, they, and everything they've done. Now their sins surround them. And their sins are in my presence. We have this thing where we think, if nobody sees me, if I don't get caught, I'm okay. God says, no, I've already caught you. I already saw it. I know what's in your heart. I know what you've been doing. You can't hide from God. The psalmist says, if I go down into the deepest hell, even there you are, Lord. If I fly to the highest mountain, you're there. No matter where I go, if I go into the deep caves, there you are, Lord. Into the depth of the ocean, you're still there with me. Don't we realize that God is with us and sees everything? He says, they don't realize that I remember these things. They make kings happy. They make, in other words, they're politically correct. They make kings happy with the wicked things they do. They make officials happy with the lies that they tell. But they're all committing adultery. This book of Hosea, and I, and I encourage you to take some time. It's not that big a book. Take some time and read it. Read through it. And when you see Israel and, and Ephraim and Samaria, and those names, and Judah, see if it doesn't apply to America. He goes... It says, foreigners are using up your strength in verse 9 of chapter 7. And you don't even realize it. Let me say, say something. How many of you realized how much we have given over to China? How many of us realized how deep in debt we were we are to China? That they've come and they've purchased properties here in the, in the United States of America, that they own companies here in the United States of America. We've given over to them our wealth. Sure, we blame them for the, the problems that have happened around us, but we sold out to them first of all. China became a world power in finance because the United States of America borrowed money from them and sold things to them. He says, your foreigners are using up your strength, but you don't even realize it. You've become like a gray-haired old man, and you don't realize it. America, we have lost our prestige. We are no longer the greatest nation in education. We're no longer the greatest nation in industry. We're no longer the greatest nation in missionary work. We've, we've sold out, we've lost it, we didn't even realize that we've gotten old and weak and we never realized it. God has preserved us to this point. He says, Israel, your arrogance testifies against you. But even after this, you don't turn to the Lord your God or look to Him for help. You're like a silly, senseless dove. You call for other countries. He mentions Egypt and Assyria here. He says, but I'm going to spread a net over you. He says, I want to reclaim you. I want you to come back. I want you to come back to me. But they don't return. Let's move on. Chapter 8 of Hosea. He says, So sound the alarm, the ram's horn. The people of Israel have rejected my promise and rebelled against my teachings. They cry out to me, 
And they say, we recognize that you're our God. In America, when things go badly, we lift our voice, God, help! We recognize you're the, you're the only one who can help us. God, you're, you're our God. We're a Christian nation here. God, you've got to help us. However, he says, they have rejected what is good. See, we don't do what God wants us to do. We recognize that God is God. Some people don't even recognize that, but those who do recognize that God is God, but we don't recognize that God's Word is for us. That God's commands are for us. That God's desires are for us. He says, they choose their own kings. Kings that I did not approve of. And they choose their own princes. Princes that I don't even know. Because of this, they will be destroyed. So get rid of your idols. Get rid of these things that you put all of your trust in. Because if you don't, whatever you do is not going to prosper. He says, I've written many things in my teachings in verse 12 for them, but they don't consider those things. They consider them strange and foreign. They aren't for us. How many times have you heard people say, oh, well, that, that Bible stuff, that was for back then, you know, thousands of years ago, that was relevant, but not today. Let me tell you, God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We don't have a God of the Old Testament and a different God of the New Testament. The God who demands our worship and our, and our obedience in the Old Testament is the same God that demands our worship and our obedience in the New Testament. The same God who gave the Ten Commandments is the one who said, and when He was here on this earth as Jesus, and He said, if you are my disciples, you will hear my words and do what I say. He says, I've written many things in my teachings, but they can, don't consider them relevant for today. They don't consider them relevant for themselves. They offer sacrifices and eat meats and sacrifice, but I, the Lord, will not accept their sacrifices. I remember their wickedness, and I'll punish them. Verse 14, and the people of Israel have built palaces, and they've forgotten their maker. The people of Judah have built Many fortified cities. He says, but I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to destroy them. Folks, this is a very negative type of message, I know. But it really isn't a negative message. Because the message here is this. That if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. That's you and me. Humble ourselves and pray and seek God's faith and turn from the wickedness around us that we've been talking about. Then he says, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive our sins and, and he'll, he'll heal our land. See, the negative message here is a message that says, wake up. God wants to bless you. God wants to bring peace to you. God wants to fulfill the, the blessings that He has for you. But He can't do it as long as you ignore Him. God desires blessing and not cursing for you. God is looking for good for you and not for evil. We're going to go all the way down to chapter 14 of Hosea. The last chapter. And here's what he says. Chapter 14, verse 1. Israel, return to the Lord your God. You've stumbled because of your sin. So return to the Lord and say these things to Him. Forgive us of our sins. And bring us back, Lord. And we'll praise You with our lips. We know that we can't save ourselves and we know that we can't rely upon anyone else. And then the Lord says in verse 4, And I will cure them of their unfaithfulness, and I will love them freely, and I will no longer be angry with them. I will be like dew to the people of Israel, 
or to the people of America. And they will blossom like flowers. They will be firmly rooted like the cedars from Lebanon. They will be like growing branches. They will be beautiful like olive trees and they will be fragrant like the cedars of Lebanon. They will live again in God's shadow and they will grow like grain and they will blossom like grapevines and they will be as famous as the wines from Lebanon. He says the people of Ephraim will have nothing to do with their idols anymore. When we turn from our wickedness, when we turn from idolizing so many things that are not God, he says, then I will answer them and take care of them and I will, and, and I am going to grow like a growing, I am like a growing pine tree. Their fruit comes from me. Wise people, I'm going to close with this. Wise people, the last verse of the last chapter of the book of Hosea. Wise people will understand these things. A person with insight will recognize them. The Lord's ways are right. Righteous people live by them. But really rebellious people stumble over them. I want to read that again. Wise people will understand these things. And a person with insight will recognize them. The Lord's ways are right, and righteous people will live by them. Are you wise? Jesus said, those people who hear what I say and do what I said are like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And when the storms of life come, the, the COVID and the wars and, the, and the, the violence in the streets and the politics, when it comes against you, when sickness and disease and, and evil people come against you, he says, you will stand because you have built upon a rock. But if we continue to build our houses upon sand, the sand of our politicians, the sand of our entertainment industry, the sand of our, of our finance or financial industries, we continue to build upon those things, he says, when the storms come and the waves hit and the winds blow, and the problems arise, it collapses because there's no sure foundation. Are you wise? Are you wise this morning? This whole book of Hosea is drawing people who have been unfaithful to God, who have left God aside for other things. He calls them prostitutes. And if they come back to Him, how He will receive them and bless them and forgive their sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins before God, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all the unrighteousness. Are you wise this morning? Or are you going to just stand stubbornly and say, that's not me? We need to daily seek the Lord. Come before Him. Praise Him and thank Him. This, this week of Thanksgiving, let's... Be thankful for the fact that God has not destroyed us yet. Let's be thankful for the fact that God has been patient with us and God has continued to bless us even in the midst of our unfaithfulness. And that God will raise us up once again. Be grateful for the fact and the promise that God will raise us up again and He will treat us like His bride. And when Jesus comes and we stand before Him, we can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Praise God that He is willing to receive us back as a nation and as individuals if we turn to Him. Father, Lord, what can we say? As a nation, we, we stand guilty. As a nation, we stand guilty. As individuals, Lord, we stand guilty. But Lord, we give you thanks. I thank you, Lord God, that you've given to us your Holy Spirit, which opens our hearts and our minds to your words so that we can understand it. I thank you, Lord God, that you've given to us your Son, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood for our sins. I thank you, Father, that you've given to us the promise of eternal life for those who would make Jesus Christ their Lord. I thank you, Father, that you are with us every day, that you'll guide us and you'll, and you'll direct us and you'll protect us and you'll help us, O oh Lord God, 
each day to be better than we were the day before. We thank you, God, that you put around us people who care enough to love us in the midst of our struggles and to help us overcome the, the obstacles that are in our way. Lord, remind us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That there is nothing impossible for you, Lord God. No matter how bad or how, how wicked we have been, there is nothing impossible for you, Lord. And you can cleanse the, the darkest, most sinful heart. And you can make it white as snow. So Lord God, remind us of these things so that we, we will lift up our voices and praise you and thank you, God. We thank you, Lord God, for your love. And give all praise to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be in the name of the Lord. May God bless you this week. God loves you. Hold fast to Him. And give Him thanks for all things. Bye-bye.